no sir it's not audible right now it's not audible <laughs> विज्ञान ज्योति प्रोग्राम इन कोऑर्डिनेशन विद अमेरिकन इंडिया फाउंडेशन हैज बीन फैसिलिटेटिंग this unique lecture series for our vigyan jyoti scholars since december 2022 it is inspired by the book india science geniuses written by well known cern scientist dr arun sharma again there is some problem you know not audible now it's audible sir yeah yeah i'm really sorry so the vigyan jyoti program in coordination with american india foundation has been facilitating this unique lecture series for our vigyan jyoti scholars december 2022 it is inspired by the book india science geniuses written by well known cern scientist dr arjuna sharma Today's session is a fourth session of the lecture series for 250 JNVs. To interact with students, today we are fortunate to have with us eminent Professor Annapurni Subramaniam, Madam, who is the director of Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore, and a recipient of several awards and fellowships. To introduce Dr. Annapurni Subramaniam, Madam. to the audience i invite shri t gopalakrishna sir deputy commissioner and coordinator of vigyan jyoti program sir please uh, thank you dr minu singh a most respected professor uh, madam subramaniam and uh, all the faculty of jnvs students and vigyan jyoti team from nvs headquarters it is my pride privilege to give a very brief about madam professor subramaniam madam has done her phd in physics astronomy in 1996 from indian institute of astrophysics on the topic studies of star clusters and stellar evolution from indian institute of astrophysics she then became a post doctoral fellow at the institute and currently works as a professor and a director of the institute she is an active member of the international astronomical union her area of research is observational astrophysics using space and ground based telescopes with specific interest in understanding stars in the nearby galaxies her research also includes study of stars of various masses ages and chemical composition in nearby galaxies no. madam has extensively studied the nearest pair of galaxies the magellanic clouds she was deeply involved in the developmental activities of india's two major astronomy projects one 30 meter telescope maunaki in uh, hawaii and the second one india's first multi wavelength astronomy satellite astrosat and madam was the calibration scientist of putra violet imaging telescope payload of astrosat and it is my pride privilege to welcome madam to the fourth lecture of this series interaction with india's science geniuses which is has been organized for the girl students of class 10 and 12 registered under the vigyan jyoti program phase 4 our resource person today professor annapurna subramaniam an eminent scientist of india working in the field of astrophysics 
will talk to us about her professional journey how she has chosen the area of astrophysics which is not a very common for women scientists and enlighten us all and especially the girl students and uh, and touch the heights in scientific profession furthermore madam also will interact with the vigyan jyoti scholars who have joined the session from 250 jnvs and speak about the world of astronomy and astrophysics so that these young girls will be inspired the team at nvs headquarters dr dk modi senior consultant dr minu singh and others and the coordinating team at american india foundation mrs sonal and mrs jesli are present for supporting for support during this session i express my gratitude to professor madam for having accepted our invitation and for delivering her lecture ma'am once again on behalf of navodaya vidyalaya samiti and vigyan jyoti i extend a warm welcome to you ma'am now we look forward to your address to all of us and the interaction that is going to be followed by that thank you thank you everybody for giving me this opportunity and welcome you once again ma'am thank you thank you for the invitation you, i hope i am audible yes ma'am yeah okay and uh, uh, i'm really happy to see so thank many you, students attending this a uh, program uh, and uh, i hope to convey uh, a small Hello. i request all of you to stay muted because <laughs> it will be difficult for me to speak when uh, you also start speaking so maybe you you can note down your questions uh, uh, and at the end of the pre presentation you can ask one by one your questions so please kindly uh, mute yourself and uh, it will help me to speak for the next 10 to 15 minutes so i just would like to convey to you my journey uh, what has brought me here so far and also to convey the passion and uh, what drove me to uh, drove me into astronomy and astrophysics and what continues me to you know take this uh, the take my journey in this path so i plan to do that uh, can i share my screen and uh, show my presentation sure ma'am Yeah. So um, it was just uh, at the beginning. I was uh, being reminded that this is my second lecture, perhaps in the Vigyan Jyoti series. So first of it was in a couple of years ago, on 14th August, and I'm happy to be here and uh, uh, again uh, giving. Uh, the, I mean, I think I spoke more about uh, why do you do astronomy and astrophysics at that lecture, but I think um, as per the the series which is going on based on the book which. Uh, Uh, Archana ji brought out, which was basically highlighting the uh, the, the stories of the scientific uh, people right now in the country, which can actually which actually opened up a lot of avenues. A lot of you know you can see that things are happening in front of you around people, and through this lecture series is a very important one where you can actually interact with the people who have conveyed their stories in their book. So it's a very rare opportunity which is created and. i'm happy that asna has pursued this and uh, the the uh, vigyan jyoti program is taking this forward to so many schools and students and resource person across the country so i'm here to share my journey and i'm if you can take some inspiration or you know some learning from it i'll be really happy about it and uh, things like you know astronomy means beautiful pictures so you can look at the sky and look at stars night sky when i was a child i used to look at the night sky and get inspired about the stars so many stars in you know dark night the moon changing its face day by day and these were all my wonders when i was a child and uh, when you these days with the digital media and digital you know information available you get pretty pictures from the space telescopes like this from the hubble space telescope which has actually produced uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know curious curiosity like why are these pillars of creation out there who creates it why are they sustained do are there plants outside the solar system 
what kind of a planets are there so so many questions are being asked based on pretty pictures itself so the uh, the interest which i have and which based on which i pursued my journey and uh, so uh, um, i started off with the ground based astronomy where you can use telescopes which are on the ground to study the objects in the sky object in cosmos and that is where i started but then later on i moved on to the space uh, telescopes as well so i have um, knowledge and understanding of planning execution and you know installing telescopes as well as using them to do science in astronomy so ground based telescopes have been around for a while with the starting from galileo and there are lots of telescopes in the uh, world and india also holds a lot of telescopes and one of the pictures shown here is a telescope at the is the himalayan chandra telescope which is in the uh, himalayas which is uh, there in the union territory of ladakh in a place called hanle and this is at, a, at altitude of 4500 meters above sea level so that you have less like the least light pollution actually and clear skies so you you do don't set up telescopes in cities actually because you know because of light pollution etc you can't take good data but observatories are generally in remote places where you have clear skies and uh, less light pollution so observatories in general are are found in remote areas throughout the world and these telescopes have been the workhorses to produce a basic understanding about the the, the universe within which we are living in and uh, uh so the, the, these are the over 400 years we've been using it this is a picture of the night sky the pat you pattern you see over here is our uh, galaxy milky way so thanks to the technology astronomy is a technology driven science where technology is needed to make the telescopes the large mirrors the support structure you know and move the telescope from one point to the other collect the light and also record the images etc so all these require technology and now with just as big sorry the normal slr cameras you can capture night night sky with large exposure filters and then the software for processing so the, the astrophotography is also a very important tool and here is a photography of the night sky taken from hanley now i also wanted to inform that the area around this particular telescope was declared as the first dark sky reserve of the country and this has been declared uh, the notification is done by the uh, ut ladakh administration and soon it will be inaugurated now um, my early career like i said i was inspired by looking at the night sky and i was i used to wonder what they are and you know i used to study the patterns of the sky the constellations etc but i after i completed my masters in physics at that, that time i was very interested in doing particle physics or astronomy but i didn't have any clue who would give i mean who who has or which institute you know gives phd or other um, research programs not much of information was available but i knew that indian institute of science had a program and then applied there and then i had no clue i would be eligible or you know i will be able to pass through because i come from a, a, a town small town in kerala and not too many people have uh, traveled the path of you know going through a phd program and succeeding in it that but that those days people never asked are you going to take your path where is it going where what will you do what job will you do at the end of the day that was not the question sir the question was do you want to do it do you have do you think you 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 have you'll be able to work hard and complete it that was a question i was very ready to do that and then i was always inspired by able to be there in an observatory and be the telescope in the night that was my uh, what that's what i wanted and then when i joined my for my phd i spent a lot of time in this in this observatory uh, five years collecting data to complete my phd my supervisor was professor ram sagar and he helped a lot and uh, of course there were issues you know staying away from home spending nights at the observatory um and uh, uh, i used to spend weeks together in the observatory the so people will think well, what is this girl spending a lot of time away from home and my mother was also not very comfortable and she used to say that okay why do you want to study stars why don't you study the sun i was wonder why she is saying sun she has no she is a musician okay she is she is a professor of music in a music college so she doesn't understand much about uh, research with sun or research with stars so why she suddenly interested in me studying the sun the reason was i could spend the day time in the observatory and not the night time 
but then i the the i could there will be you know issues like this all throughout your life but you have to mitigate by explaining it to them and sharing your passion with them so what i did was i took her to the observatory and showed her it's a, such a nice place nice people around and it's a, it's a brilliant place and i'm so happy here so once she she understood that i'm happy there and i have the passion to do it and it's a wonderful place she 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 was very happy so most of the time and even through entire life i have shared my passion with my family that is the reason why they let me do whatever i want because that's what i want to do that's what makes me happy so so that is very important for you to convey to them that look this is what i like and this is what my passion is so once you share that passion with the people around you you can take them along very easily similarly they you should also you, you know you have to respect their passion because that is what keeps them happy and that's what uh, keeps them driving going otherwise they'll become you know dull and you can't be very productive efficient people so that's that's helped me all through my life that's what i learned from that you know event in my life and that time so i start started studying star clusters groups of stars what can i understand groups of stars are actually stars which are having the same age but they live for a very very long time sun lives for you know billions of years so people will ask like how do you study something which doesn't change at all throughout a lifetime right it takes too long a time but then how do you study them the same question like you know human lifetime is 100 years nobody lives more than 100 years to study a lifetime right by the time you also die how does it happen so you have to take at any instant person of different ages and study at the same time the same concept applies to objects in the kindly mute your kindly mute your microphone please thank you so um so that is the trick because you can't live throughout the lifetime of anything to study changes but then biologically if you want to study evolution you study look at uh, objects which have lesser time scale so stars which are very massive less live less but uh, for uh, the lifetime is less but the small stars like the sun live for a very long time so i study how what chemicals kind of make inside them how they throw out are the stars born as singles they are they born in groups what are their you know properties what happens to them if they born in groups and what happens to them if they born separately etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, so i also study the nearby galaxies so when you look at the sky this is the night sky with the this is our milky way and you can see these two systems right these are kind of patches in the sky and these are prominent patches in the sky which is seen from the southern hemisphere not from india because it is actually in the southern sky and at any time any latitude you can see only that part of the sky you cannot see the other part of the sky in, when you are in equator you can see most of north and south but not everything near the poles you can't see so a uh, southern part sees the sky differently and the northern part sees the sky differently actually and the, the most importantly all the objects in the sky gets you know projected you feel as though everything is the same distance but they're not there are varied distances and estimating distances is another major problem in astronomy because it's not easy direct measurements of distances is very difficult so i used to study these two galaxies if you look at it they are well separated these are actually patches but they're not patches they are actually galaxies and actually on 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 the bible thing they are actually a satellite of our galaxy and they interact like this this you know my arrow you look at here the uh, the most abundant element is hydrogen and if you map the hydrogen intensity around these two galaxies you see this you can see huge amount of hydrogen around them which tells you that these galaxies have been interacting so astronomy studies material in various ways like you know hydrogen which is actually in a gaseous form so how do you detect it the detection of them is in the radio if you look at a very high uh, ionized gas so this hydrogen can be um, in a molecular form it can be in atomic form in an ionized form and the temperatures are different and the way it emits for you to detect is a different so basic physics come in to figure out how do you detect a molecule how do you detect an atom how do you detect a proton how do you detect an electron so these are all basic physics when it comes to astronomy this physics is applied to extreme conditions either it is hot very very hot millions of degrees like in the center of stars or very very cold in between the galaxies 
So the conditions are different. So it's basically physics applied to different conditions. So you can see cometary tails are cold, you know, centers of stars are hot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I also study the ground-based astronomy and space-based astronomy. There are certain part of the wavelength, like the X-rays UV, our ozone stops them from coming in. So if you, that doesn't mean we cannot receive those rays on the ground, right? So that doesn't mean the objects out there are not emitting in those wavelengths. It means that that thing is blocked. But if you want to study them, you have to keep your camera above the atmosphere. How do you put the camera above the atmosphere? You have to have a satellite which goes around the Earth. That is why you need space telescopes. So once you put the space telescopes, space telescopes can actually collect the, uh, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, the high energy photons, which are coming in the X-ray, et cetera. Now, it is good that we have a nose on, the life on the Earth is saved, and the high energy of photons are stopped. But if you want to study them and actually see whether sun-like stars, how much do they emit, you know, for planets which are there outside the solar system, we need to study their energy budget, et cetera. So we have space telescopes. And there are lots of space telescopes. And India is one country with the capability of launching and operating space telescope. And I was fortunate to work on one. And you have seen many of them, Chandra, HST. They're all in different wavelengths. And when you look at any object in the sky, it can be the shape of that object can be different in different wavelengths because the emission mechanism is different. So I don't want to get into the physics. I don't, maybe you know about it, like the low temperature stars will be redder, the high temperature stars will be, or the hotter stars will be bluer. So, you know, the emitting part of it will be star is a, a, all, it's, it's a ball of huge ball of plasma. But galaxies are different. You can see X-ray emission only from the center of the galaxy, but the hydrogen emission will come from the entire galaxy. So emission, the, 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 you know, the picture it portrays will be different. So one has to understand multiple mechanisms happening in one place itself. So you would have seen the James Webb telescope, Webb telescope producing a wonderful images that is in the infrared. So you're looking at a cooler part of the, you know, the molecular emission, et cetera, et cetera, to find out what is happening around uh, the, uh, the, the, the pla planet forming disk or very the, the red shifted, um, you know, electromagnetic spectrum from a distant universe, et cetera. So the, every experiment will have a science case. And for that science case, you have to design the experiment. So I was involved in this particular program and I was the calibration scientist on the um, um, ultraviolet telescope. And there would be, uh, I just wanted to show that this is the handover time when the UV telescope was handed over. Most of the time you will be the only person involved there, will be the woman, only woman out there. So it happens, but that doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to be confident and just do it. That's it, over. And you don't have to worry about who's out there, who I am, why am I here, nothing like that. Just look at your focus on what was supposed to be delivered, complete it, and be uh, be confident that you can do it. Most of the time, I find that women step in and say that, okay, can you do it? That kind of a thinking itself puts you on the back foot. That should never be there. We just do it. You are a person out there. So that is the first thing you should get in mind, okay? So there's nothing to worry about. You can do it. And uh, this is just, I, I just wanted to drive that point. So when I was the calibration scientist, this is the, one of the very first images we got. And you can see that this particular image is from the UVET. And this was from the previous uh, US mission. And we, easily we could show that this, uh, this image coming from our telescope was much better than the previous image. And it really opened up our eyes and said that this instrument, which we have created and the ISRO is flying up, is one of the world-class instruments. So this is actually doing a very good job and we have covered seven years in orbit. And now we have done wonderful science looking at studying the binaries and uh, you know uh, the remnants of stellar evolution, et cetera. I can talk more about it if there are any questions. So I work with a lot of students. This is only one small group of students. Uh, they're, they're my PhD students and they have done a lot of work. I can talk about it later. I also have worn a different hats other than a scientist and the calibration scientist. I was the uh, software delivery head for the uh, 30 meter telescope project. And uh, I was uh, actually uh, delivered a complete module and working with the company called ThoughtWorks. And this is the team meeting we had in the ThoughtWorks offices in Pune. 
And this delivery is the US uh, project office. And you can see the project office people and ThoughtWorks people and the uh, uh, India 30 meter telescope project people. So I completed and it was a big uh, learning curve for me regarding project management. But this project took about uh, uh, four years to complete the delivery and handle right from the uh, writing the conceptual note to delivery. And I also I was wearing the hat of the uh, software a science contribution from India heading that role and organized a India TMT science meet of about 200 participants, half of them from abroad. And this is in Mysore actually. So this is what I contributed. And that time we literally brought everybody up and showed that capability where India has never delivered a major instrument for any major telescope. And uh, we wanted to start working in that direction. And we participate at the end of the meeting, we participated in multiple modules, which actually resulted in a good share for India to participate in a bigger telescope, bigger delivery for Indian instruments. So that's what I said. You need to you need to take forward a step and then take it forward. I'm also a PI for the next space mission. And uh, this is going through the initial uh, project phase. And on top of everything, I also am a musician. I, I play violin and uh, this is my family. And I do for uh, uh, accompany my father on concerts. And these are some of the pictures. And my parents, I come from a musical family and my parents are musicians. Nobody was a scientist at home. And I chose to take that path and I just continue to continue his music. My daughter is an accomplished singer as well as a dancer. And my son is also a percussionist. So life is a package deal. You have to take it, take out, take everything along. Your family, your passion, your passion other than what you want to do, science, etc. So it's a package deal. So you have to take it along and you can do it. I'm sure you can do it. Definitely you can do it. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. We are overwhelmed to see the presentation and this is very inspiring for all of us. And the thing that you said that we have to take everything along with us, that's really true. So, uh, ma'am, since you have talked about the entire work and uh, your uh, journey from masters and after that, since our audience are mainly school students today, we want to know your journey from school to college. So what was your journey from school to college? You'd like to know some insights if you have something to share. Yeah, so um, I started off, actually I studied in um, government school uh, from first standard to 10th standard. And first standard to fourth standard was a co-ed school. And uh, it was the local language medium, Malayalam medium. So uh, I studied in that school and then I have moved to a girls school because at that time you have only boys separate school and girls separate school for a fifth standard onward. So I had to join a girls school for that. I joined a girls school. And uh, that time my father decided that since if I want to pursue higher education, I need to know English and I need to do it in the English medium and not in the uh, Malayalam medium. So she shifted me in fifth to English medium. I had no idea how to handle it. I will, I passed in the first exam, I passed only in mathematics because mathematics did not have any language. I could understand it and probably Hindi. Rest of it, I just incredibly failed. I said, this is not what I want to do. I was like terribly upset and, you know, I didn't want to, I was just didn't know what to do. But then uh, the teacher said that it's okay. You, you will face some problem. Don't worry about it. You just uh, figure out how to handle it learn it slowly and then do it. And then I'll, I had to literally work hard and uh, make sure that, you know, I you come with a lot of pride. You know, in the previous school, I was the topper and then you come here and you fail the exams. And uh, maybe you go through some one of you go through this kind of a crisis. But that happens. Doesn't matter. You say that, OK, one exam doesn't matter. Forget it. We'll do it. Then I started working out a, uh, you know, a plan by which you compare your uh, English textbook and Malayalam textbook and then read together and see what it means. I had to build up my vocabulary and et cetera, et cetera. And we had a lot of divisions. It's a large girls school actually. Okay, divisions will go up to J, H, K, L, M sometimes. 
every it's a large number 30 students per class There's only one division in english so even the faculty or teachers come they don't normally teach completely in english they'll become part in english and part in malayalam so you can't actually converse you can't build up vocabulary and things like that so you have to put in an extra effort but it doesn't matter it doesn't you don't have to overcome it overnight you don't have to change yourself overnight it takes time but accept it work towards it by end of the year i was fine and then slowly build up around it and things like that. It goes ups and down, it's fine. Because in school, there's a long period and you'll have to... And we didn't have much of a pressure from my home. They said, it's okay, you as long as you pass, it's fine with them. It, they, they had no pressure, so I just went along. And uh, since I was in music, I used to participate in all com competitions, group songs, organize this, that. Everything will go. And towards 10th, I realized that, oh my God, I have not prepared for exam. I was so scared and uh, uh, I had a teacher next door. He used to help me with some tuitions. I used to go for him to tuitions, only maths and some physics and something he used to teach. And uh, during the pre-boards, I had gone to youth festival in Kerala and then I got some win won some prizes and came back. School was happy, but the teacher was not happy because pre-boards I was not prepared at all. Then that is the day I realized that Nothing can, you cannot escape uh, anything. You have to be planned properly. Without planning, nothing works. So I realized that, no, without planning, I should not have done it. I regretted the whole thing. But I had only about one, 10 days to prepare. So I came up with a plan, worked out everything, this many hours for this, this many hours for this, and I have to stick to it. Planning is one, sticking to the plan is another. So that is the first time I learned that planning is extremely important in life. Oh, yeah. was by myself. And then I stuck to it and I came first in school. So I was happy I did it. But I learned a lot from that because when I came to second year of my plus two, just one month before. And same thing, I was in a government college and I had to prepare for the exam myself. I have to you know, chart out a program, study, etc. Now I had written on everything and then my parents don't come into picture at all because they say, you do whatever you want. We are musicians. If you want to come to music, we'll teach you. But if you want to do physics or maths, it's up to you. You take care of yourself. So I had charted a plan and I'm down with high fever and chicken box. I can't do anything. I can't study. So I turn the entire things around so that I give less time for um, languages and more time for this thing. So I rearranged everything. Even I used to watch cricket. That's the time we got TV in the house. Everybody said, don't get TV. It's a distraction. They can't study. But then I said, no, there is a way in which you can study. So when the ball is bowled, I will watch. When it is fielded and the person comes back, I have to finish one problem within that time. So I timed it. So I'm just telling you it's important. It's very important to plan it. You can do everything, whatever you want, you can do. Still, I'm doing whatever I can do, I can do. I'm doing, I want, I'm playing violin. I don't have a cook. I do the, all the cooking in my house myself because I want to eat the food the way I would like it to be prepared, right? So you have to know what you want to do, allocate time. And there's enough time for the rest of the day. If you plan it, you can definitely do it. That's what I learned. And I've been following that from ever since. And it really has helped me. But of course, I'm saying it because I've traveled a lot of distance and looking backwards. So I can easily say that. But it's, I believe it. it. It's worked for me. Yeah, Planning is extremely important and sticking to it. Thank you, ma'am. That was a great lesson for all of us, for students also and for us also, that planning is very important. Uh, ma'am, we'd like to know, like you said, that uh, you came from Hindi media, uh, from a uh, medium government school to English medium. Then how did you decide to pursue physics and then after astrophysics? Like you have interest in uh, when you uh, used to look at the sky, you had interest in this. But how did you decide to pursue this as a career? Yeah. So um, see, there are two things. One is you have to eliminate those you don't want. You're not happy doing it. Okay. So I was not happy doing chemistry. So I eliminated it. So I've left left with physics and mathematics. And um, all my friends joined mathematics. I had a group of friends. Everybody went and joined mathematics. They didn't want physics. I said, no, I, I, I'm not able to relate to mathematics, but I can relate to physics. 
So I said, let me try out physics. If it doesn't work out, I'll come back to math, but I have to try out physics. That's why my, I think that's what my heart is. I want to do something with my hand and, you know, work out things. And, and I would like to fix, even as a kid, when my dad used to fix fuse, I used to fix fuse with him. So uh, many things at home I repair, you know, tap, opening the tap and putting the washer. Previously, only the brass taps used to be there. The washers will go, you know, very, very fast it will go. So you have to open the tap and put the washer in, etc. So all those things I used to do. So I know that I can tinker with something and know it. So I kind of joined physics. It was not easy decision. It was difficult because everybody, nobody wanted to take physics. But I said, no, let me try it out with physics. But as you said, as you also noticed, I mean, uh, music was always there at home. So this is always a plan B. Every time, sometimes I say that physics is a bit difficult and things are not going well, then I'll say, okay, ditch physics, they go to music, take the music path, don't go to physics. But some, I had a teacher who would help us or inspire us by asking questions. And um, I'll give you an example. It's a potentiometer experiment in, uh, where you have to measure the resistance. Okay. It's got 10 meter, potentiometer is a 10 meter. And in the records, you have to write, make records, right? So there the, you follow what is the picture given in the guide. You know, practical guidebook will be there. And the guidebook has shown four lines instead of 10 lines. So everybody will copy four lines. And the, the teacher will ask, is it a four meter wire or a 10 meter wire? We'll all say 10 meter wire. Then why are you shown four lines of one meter? The text, the book showed it. Why do you want to believe the book? You think you should write 10 lines. You should draw 10 lines or only draw one line. Why four? Don't follow that person. Think for yourself. So this kind of things where we're reproducing what is exactly in the book without thinking, he would not like. He started asking questions. Why do you do this? Why do you want to believe it? So we started asking that questions ourselves before submitting the, the record. That was a big beginning, actually. You know, when you write down, when you ask, why are you writing it down? Because he wrote it like this. Is it actually you want to write it down? Can you write it differently? So that started, you know, working and a few. Uh, and we use differently. And that made me quite a bit interested. And I said, no, that there's a lot more to do it and learn there than what you can see. It's much more than what you can see. So that opened up our eyes and it, it, I, I owe a lot to that teacher. Uh, he was uh, uh, Sudarshan. So he opened up us and two of us actually brought, came out and that the other person went to IIT Mumbai and he's a professor there. And now I, I joined Astrophysics. So two people came out of that particular you know, group. So I'm happy I owe it to that teacher. So that, that works. So you have to stir that, you know, you have to take you out of that comfort zone and say that, why are you doing this? Can you think in a different way? So that helped. So that's how I came into physics. And of course, I said, as I said, I used to look up at the sky and I knew I wanted to do the sky and I, I applied to IIC. Fortunately, I got selected and then I moved to astrophysics, Indian Institute of Astrophysics for my PhD. So yeah, that sums it up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering this question. Uh, ma'am, my next question is, like this journey, the entire journey would not have been easy for you. So uh, can you tell us about some of the challenges did you, uh, you faced in this journey and how did you overcome this, the challenges you faced? Yeah, see, most important thing is accept that there's a challenge, okay, and face it and see, find a way to solve it. There's no point in keep saying that, oh, my God, there's a problem there. Oh, my God, there's a problem there. And keep saying, oh, my God, there's a problem there. We try to tend to go around, beat around the bush, saying that there is a problem there and circle around it without actually saying, what is the problem here? How do I solve it so that I can, I can stop saying that, you know, accept that there's a problem. Just like when I move to the thing, I accept that there's a problem. I need to find a way to solve it. So figure out, do it. and then. It's like, you know, you're driving out and then there's a, a huge traffic jam or something like that happened. You can sit there, stop the car engine and say that, oh my God, there's a problem in front of me. You can't do that. You have to find a way to steer yourself through it and go. It. So similarly, you might find yourself in a problem every day, day in and day out. The only thing to do is that 
accept the challenge, find a way to solve it and move forward. Now also find a problem every day. So you, everyone's life is full of issues only. So starting when your children, you will have probably saying that, oh my God, I have a lot of issues. More and more issues. Will you, um, you keep increasing your baggage down the line. So for women particularly, things keep increasing. Your responsibility keeps increasing. Now I have children, two children. They are outside, but then you have to keep constantly in touch with them. You have to guide them. You have to, you know, uh, uh, mentor them. So it's a level of activity is a bit different. I have my elderly father with me, so I have to look after their health. So in-laws were there, so their health, etc. It's a package deal, as I said. So challenges are there, but one thing is very important that you have to tell your people around you that you are passionate about it and you value your time and you want to save all the time you have to do whatever you like. For example, my father-in-law was there at home and he was not well and I was not able to go to office to, you know, to work. So I would go a little bit time and come back a little bit time and come back and I kind of adjusted for a short period. And my students uh, comprehensive viva was coming. I had no choice how to do that. So I decided that, okay, I have to do it together. What I do, did was I brought entire research uh, group to my house. I took everybody home and made sure that my father-in-law is uh, proper. He uh, gave everything, made converted my TV into a, a screen for projection, connected the laptop. Everybody sat together and did a complete uh, presentation there and discussion. In between, I attended to him or gave lunch and everything and did. So everybody was taken care. So you have to have innovative solutions because it's important that you have to take along. And one, one thing, one more thing I want to say is that never think of quitting what you want to do. When I got married, I was in the first year of my PhD. Everybody thought I will stop my PhD and go away because those days PhD was not easy because you can't take anything home. You have to be in the institute and institute is open only for 10 to five. You can only do limited time. How do you do? Or you go to the observatory and stay for a long time. It takes a lot of time. So people thought I will not continue. Quitting was never an option for me. Whatever you do, maybe I'll take a longer period, whatever, it doesn't matter. Quitting was never, a, never an option. So don't do it, go slow on something. If you are even in your school career, you'll have music and studies going together. You'll find it difficult. You can go slow on music for a little while or you know, in your passion, art or sports or anything for that matter, go slow, but don't quit. You can pick it up later once, you know, some studies, intense period slows down, you pick up the other one. If you stop it, starting is a big problem. Don't do that. This is what I think uh, important to continue what you want to do. Ma'am, with every question you give us so important, such important lessons. Thank you so much for this. Like very rightly you said, quitting is not an option. So this is a lesson for all our students also. So moving to my next question, ma'am, definitely after today's session, many students would like to pursue physics and astrophysics. So it would be great if you could tell us about the campus life of Indian Institute of Astrophysics and also about some avenues where students can pursue this course, both Indian and international as well. Yeah, so astrophysics um, uh, is a technology driven uh, field and also data driven field. So when I was a PhD student, data was very, very scanty. You have to go to the telescope. The data was not available to do research for everyone. Now, in this uh, century, and particularly in the last 10, 15 years, there is a data democratization has happened. There's a, all these missions have actually made the data public. Not only the data is public, even the tools and techniques for analysis is public. So there is a lot of citizen science, which is, can be doable, galaxy research. Small, small, very short projects can be done by anybody because huge amount of data is available, publicly available. So uh, astronomy is opened up because of this data democratization, lab availability of technology like computer, internet, et cetera, lot of sites, information, et cetera. And there are a lot of places where students can do projects or, uh, you know, uh, even remotely you can work. There are many small uh, projects can be done remotely, etc. And uh, so that way astronomy is opened up. 
there are a lot of institutions within the country who offer now you know astronomy courses even private universities are hiring student uh, hiring professors because astronomy has become more you know people are getting more known about it because all these discoveries of exoplanets discovery of gravitational waves you know exciting times and now we have this ligo project which is mega projects is also approved so a lot more activity will be there and uh, so india is poised in a much bigger way with uh, astronomy in the case of iia um, the iia has always been a, a place where we, full of women actually good number of women scientists women students within the observatories etc so the schools can visit the nearest we have an observatory in kodaikanal in the southern india we have more and we have one in leh ladakh and uh, these observatories are open for visitors we have a visitor center museum etc so we do welcome uh, schools to come over and participate and visit our observatories and learn about it we can also write to us and ask for virtual tours where we can show you the telescope in a virtual mode and explain what things are there etc before you actually plan a trip that's also possible and outside also abroad also there are a lot of astronomy is a, a Uh, it's an old uh, science but it's also an exciting field because newer and newer discoveries are being made and because of newer and bigger telescopes are being launched so it's an exciting time ahead thank you ma'am uh, moving to my last question after this uh, students will ask their doubts so uh, what is your vision for the students in india towards stem careers especially for girls um yeah i think uh, uh, the younger generation of india is extremely smart and they are much very capable and they are you know the learning skills are very high and they are very quick learners no doubt about it it's just that you have to put your heart into it you have, you have to put your heart and soul into it then you can achieve anything and i've seen that students pick up uh, the uh, skill sets and tools very quickly and uh, they, they they can do it and with this digital era of you know um, mobile phones and computers and access to data access to information available everywhere and aspirations and uh, there is enough i think more and more women are actually becoming prominent like you know you getting the technology is allowing me to talk to you directly now so we are rightly using the technology to right come across and uh, uh, we have a unique capability of taking along our culture our heritage our you know our values and uh, going along with our you know the 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 new trend with respect to technology bracing on the technology without any problem and uh, women for that matter also have the extra capability of multitasking and uh, i'm sure we have we are from the day one asked to do multiple things and that helps to do multitasking very easily so no doubt with our uh, compassionate approach we are not uh, you know aggressive leaders it doesn't you don't need an aggressive leader you just need a compassionate person who can attend to everybody and then be uh, um, at it so we can do it and then the opportunities are a lot all that you need to do is to dream high you need to dream high be confident and be uh, be have a determined that yes i will do it i want to do it and nobody is going to stop me from doing it take any path you will be able, you will be successful thank you ma'am that was a great session so uh, now i would like to invite the students to ask their doubts so our first student is roshni from class 10 jnv east godavari Roshni, are you there? Here is 
especially how they are held together in the sky are there any star clusters that are yeah that so are you can see naked? yes yes there are many of them which are visible to our naked eye the pleiades and hyades pleiades i think in our local i think it's kritika so you can see it in the um, now now it will be set actually you will be able to see in the actually in the december january period in the western sky and orion has clusters but naked eye clusters hyades and uh, pleiades are naked eye clusters and uh, uh, now you should be able to see the beehive cluster which is up in the uh, for the equatorial up and there would be a couple of them little fainter clusters are naked eye clusters yeah but i should also remind you that, you that the because of light pollution uh, the how much how many stars you can see in the night sky differs from place to place when as a kid all these were easily visible because there were hardly any light pollution but now light pollution has increased and because of that you will are able to hardly see any stars in the sky you have to protect the night sky the we are losing the wonders thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, our second student is katherine jason class 12 from jnv ernakulam um uh, ma'am the idea of stellar revolution is really interesting because if we look at the stars it does not appear to change at all it looks the same right from when we were small till now please can you explain this concept of evolution of stars to us thank you ma'am yeah that's a great question i a uh, kind of indicated it in my talk that uh, the stars evolve in a very 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 long time so time scale for uh, um uh, you know um, um uh, evolution of the star and the lifetime of the uh, humans is uh, very small a lifetime of humans is very small the lifetime of stars is like billions of years like sun like stars is billions of years in fact we talk about only about million a million years is the minimum age with respect to you know 100 years kind of thing so you cannot see the you cannot expect to see the evolution of stars it's like you know uh, you can um, say that as, uh, evolution of even um, any any life form you can't see right because the evolution of even biological life form evolution is very very long period so that also we cannot see like how humans evolved from something else that we cannot see so if you want to study stellar evolution you cannot wait for a star to evolve to see it because that's impossible so how it is studied is you have to have a figure out a way to there are billions of stars even within our galaxy you have to figure out a way to estimate the age of each star like if you want to study the evolution of a human a human in one person's lifetime you will end up you will require the entire lifetime for of a human to study a human itself right how do you do that you can't do that right so you study a kid you identify the age so you want to study the what happens when a uh, starting from the birth and the death of a human you start taking a data from a, a kid to a you know a student a school student or college student to a middle age to an old age then you look at exactly how what happens from birth to death similarly for stars we we have a method to identify the age once you identify the age then you can see what has happened but here in the case of humans we don't see any with respect to the the way it, it is very similar across but here the main important thing in the case of stars is that mass of the star matters the sun like stars lives for billions of years but a very big star like 10 times the so is a mass of the sun lives for only 1000th of the time 1 million year and the chemistry it produces is different so we need to understand them so there is ways it's difficult but there are ways thank you ma'am so much ma'am our third student is vishruti patel class 12 from jnv surender nagar vishruti are you there yeah i think she's coming over to the mic uh, hello ma'am i am vishruti patel of class 12 science jnv surender nagar from gujarat 
my question uh, to you is ma'am can you elaborate on the uh, difference between astronomy and astrophysics yeah so very fundamental question uh, the astronomy is basically dealt with the uh, observations and the data collection where you see it observe it and note it but when you observe it and note it down these are the facts which you see but why do you see them why is it there so you have to apply physics to it right so then once you start applying physics to it and using the physical equations and physical laws to what the observations is taken that becomes astrophysics so astronomy is basically said as the observations and no noticing it's important because if you want before you apply physics to it you need to figure out what is exactly going on planetary motions people have collected the data of a very very long time how the planets move how the stars move etc etc right so then that observation area and collecting data and noting down things is basically astronomy so in general now it is used as astronomy and astrophysics together but then the experimental observational part is normally called as traditionally it's astronomy and then when you start applying physical principles and deriving uh, results out of it and interpreting it as a physical system it's called astrophysics yes thank you by yeah explained so ma'am the last question is from sharda choudhry class 12 jnv ajmer sharda are you there good evening good evening ma'am good evening ma'am i am sharda choudhry from jnv ajmer you told us that telescope fulfill our desire to view object at micro level my question is why can't it help us to view black hole thank you um uh, okay so the uh, telescope is basically something which collects an elect uh, photons all right so it can be photon of um, any wavelength in the sense that within the electromagnetic spectrum um it can be an optical photon in the or radio photon and it has to be you have to collect the photon and then it, just like eyes eyes can see something only when the light the photon which is reflected from that particular object falls on your retina and then your eye records it if there's no light coming from that object you cannot see that object right that's how you see the object fundamental principle either it be a telescope or your eye if an object is not emitting anything or not reflecting any light you cannot see it In the case of black hole black hole is something which uh, a physical principle by which light cannot escape from that body so you will never able to get a photon which is emitted out of the black hole and which can either enter the telescope nor enter your eye in which case you cannot detect it so all black hole detections are indirect detections because of either a material around it or some stars moving around it so it is not from black hole but something around it thank you thank you so much ma'am for answering the doubts of our student it was a great session thank you so much for coming and giving us time and the valuable lessons now i would like to invite ms jessly from american india foundation to give a vote of thanks jessly Jessie, you are on mute. Good afternoon, one and all present here. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a great session. So even somebody who is not into astrophysics or physics itself will literally listen because the way you explained every point of your slides. that is a presentation was like i felt like some curious brainy or smart kid explaining or showing all the things in his kitty or toy room i don't know what to say but still it was really interesting it was really fun and it was motivating but more than astrophysics because we are here for uh, an rmi wonderful rmi session but showing the other part of you was really really important like i uh, i will take two points with me even after the session one is that you told that we all should have a plan we all have plans but you told that we have to execute it so that was more important because you rightly said you managed home 
uh, your work your passion children and music everything so it was really motivating ma'am thank you so much and the other thing which is staying with me is that you told that teachers needn't be aggressive but they should be compassionate we miss such teachers so uh, teachers who are present here can take it as a real motivation because we all have really good teachers but sometimes that compassion that will be a little bit less so if the teachers are compassionate and definitely this will instill the love of any subjects let it be science or from stem or from even the language so the children will be motivated so i thank uh, thank you ma'am for instilling these values to through this uh, great rmi session now i take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, modi sir gopal krishna sir sanjeeda ma'am meenu ma'am and everyone uh, behind this uh, successful event without your support it wouldn't be uh, successful so thank you once again all my dear students and teachers for uh, encouraging students to come and sit here and uh, supporting us thank you so much thank you thank, thank you yes sir thank you everyone thank you ma'am thank you bye 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 ma'am thank you ma'am